Mr. Nicolo Galante, COO of Central Group. Mr. Yoshihisa Kainuma, President and CEO of Mini Bear Mitsumi. And the moderator for this session is Sonoko Watanabe, Editor in Chief of Nikkei Asian Review. Ms. Watanabe, please begin the session. Hello, yes, uh, thank you for coming to this event. So after uh, Deputy Prime Minister's speech, so we will start our three panel discussion. And uh, this session is uh, first of all, oh, the topic of this session is optimizing management for today's global changes. So basically, uh, as everybody knows it, for last a few years, we are facing the drastic change uh, in both the politics and the economics, and probably also the technology and the, the people's way of life. So today, uh, we have uh, three distinguished speakers, and uh, uh, the, they have the, some common the character. Uh, their company is uh, uh, every industry giant, and also they have the business beyond the border. The first, uh, we, I will explain the dis uh, procedure of this session first, uh, every uh, three speakers will make a brief presentation of the uh, company's situation, uh, what is a target, or what is a uh, company's responsibility, and later we will move to the, some question and answer session. And also, at the end of the Q&A session, yeah, I will invite some questions from the floor. So uh, please prepare uh, the listeners uh, what kind of questions uh, would you want to pose. So first, yeah, I will introduce uh, Mr. Tirapon Chansui, the president and CEO of the Thai Union Group. And I think probably everybody knows the Thai Union, or at least have already eaten some of the Thai Union products, uh, because the uh, Thai Union is uh, quite famous of the world's largest canned tuna food producer. Uh, but uh, for recent years, expanding quite rapidly, and now it's uh, not only tuna, or lobster, or other seafood, and also their geographical business area is also expanding uh, beyond Asia to the Europe or the United States. So uh, Mr. Tirapon is uh, leading this uh, huge expansion of this company. So the, Mr. Tirapon, the first explain that what is happening in the Thai Union is. So uh, Mr. Tirapon, please. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to thank you, uh, Nikkei and its organizing team for inviting me to, to participate in this forum. I'm the president and CEO of Thai Union Group. Our company was founded in 1977, and we will celebrate our 40th anniversary later this year. Over the years, our company has grown to achieve around four billion US dollars in revenues. And we are listed in the stock exchange of Thailand since 1994. Given the theme of today's forum, I thought of covering three topics during my opening remarks. Firstly, I would like to tell you a little bit more about our company in order to set the context. Secondly, I would like to share with you the global mega trends that collectively all of us are experiencing. But perhaps I will talk about them from our industry perspective. Thirdly, I will tell you briefly how we're addressing yes, this trend within our company. So let's start with a bit more about Thai Union. Our company vision is to be the world's most trusted seafood leader, caring for our resources, to nurture generations to come. We want to achieve this vision by being the seafood industry leading agent of change. We believe that it is our responsibility as one of the leading global seafood company to drive change in our industry, especially the area of our focus is on resource management and labor practice. Our recent agreement with Greenpeace is a testament of this belief. 
We believe in making a real positive difference to our consumers, our customer, and the way our category are managed. Today, we operate globally, have some uh, iconic brands such as Chicken VC, John West, King Oscar, Select, and many others. Our geographic footprint cover North America, Europe, Middle East, and Asia. Our far-reaching footprint give Thai Union direct access to consumers and stakeholders worldwide. Asia is our home, and it is also the location of our largest manufacturing footprint. In Asia, we employ over 36,000 employees uh, in this region, and these factories export product to four corners of the world, where these products are sold either under our brands or under our uh, customers. Asia is also a very important market for us from a demand perspective. Our brand has been offering Asian consumers with quality tuna, sardine, mackerel, and fish snack for over 20 years. We are also keen to bring our global brands that has been acquired over the past years to Asian consumers. As an example, we have just launched King Oscar, uh, where it is a leading brand in Norway into Thailand and China. Given the nature of the seafood industry, we operate in a globally interconnected value chain. For example, tuna caught in Western Pacific Ocean by Taiwanese boats, processed in Thailand, and re-export to our customers around the world. Another example is salmon. The salmon grown in the farm in Chile, again sent to Thailand, processed, and re-export back to Japan for sashimi uh, product. There are several macroeconomic trends that are posing challenges and opportunities for all of us. These trends over the last 12 to 18 months have been on the cover of nearly every magazine, and I'm sure you are well aware of them. Let me articulate some of these trends and how they are impacting us. The first global trend is the protectionist wave taking hold in the United States and some Western European countries. The desire to shield a country, domestic industry, from foreign competition through taxation or other means will surely disrupt the value chain of many industries. Seafood, as I mentioned earlier, is an interconnected global value chain. We are monitoring this situation closely, and we will react accordingly. The second trend is a step change in currency. We have two examples in front of us. Brexit leads to a sharp devaluation of the British pound. Similarly, a sharp devaluation in Egyptian power occurred in November 2017. These devaluations have imposed significant challenges for those companies exporting products to this country. It has clearly affected the profitability of the business and also the company. We are addressing this trend by developing products through our innovation center that can deliver incremental value to the consumers. The third global trend is the slowing down of China. For many years, China had provided the global economy a robust outlook, driven by an emerging middle class consumer. As this growth has slowed down, companies are looking for other revenue of growth. In our industry, and broadly for other Asian countries, CLMV countries provide an excellent opportunity. The next trend is around disruptive technologies. I'm sure most of you are familiar uh, with uh, this topic. Even in our industry, seafood, 
which we all used to believe that we are in the low tech industry and technology should not be even uh, disrupt. But today, even the company in the seafood industry need to rethink about it and see how we can embrace the technology into our business and into our organization, either to use the technology to drive the cost down or to improve the customer service. The last trend is the worsening global geopolitical situation. The chart you see on the screen is compiled and monitored by the Council on Foreign Relations. This chart identifies geopolitical conflict around the world and mark them as improving or worsening. Uh, unfortunately, you can see most of the, the, the dots here are in red. In, in our industry today, I must say that it's very hard to fly the bright spot in the global map today. So I think in our industry today, growth is become secondary. How we can protect our protect profitability is become our key. So how do we cope with this global trend? Well, we have always operated in an ever-changing world. The last 18 months has shown us that even the surest aspect of our business cannot be taken for granted. Change is certain. However, change will also present opportunities. Depends on who can seize that. So I look forward to the discussion today and sharing how we put in place processes to deal with change in a systematic manner. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tirapong. Yeah, we really understand that uh, the seafood industry is uh, facing the every challenge and every change of the world quite directly. Yes. And the second uh, the presenter is the Mr. Nicolo Galante. Uh, he is a chief operating officer of the uh, Central Group. And the Central Group is, of course, uh, people know that uh, in the detail giant in Thailand and also the now uh, try to expand from Thailand. But also, uh, Mr. Garant is covering area is uh, e-commerce and omnichannel. It is uh, also the area now uh, very the harsh competition is emerging all over the world. And also one thing uh, probably the interesting is uh, actually the Mr. Garant's background is from the beginning not a business person. Yeah, he's a trained a nuclear engineer and worked as a researcher in the CERN, a quite famous European Research Institute about uh, uh, nuclear technology. And after the spending some time in McKinsey, now uh, he's leading the center's quite new area uh, of the expansion. Uh, so the priest, uh, Mr. Garante, uh, please do your presentation. Thank you. So, Kap, Konnichiwa, hello. I'm the chief operating officer of uh, Central Group. Um, if there is one thing that has been constant for my life is uh, towers and, and rivers. So I started from my hometown, Torino, then in Italy, then moved to Paris to be a consultant for retailers, helping retailers transform into omnichannel organization. And then a bit more than one year ago to Bangkok to lead the transformation of a central group, one of the most successful uh, retail companies in Asia, but to make them even more successful, to expand uh, thanks to the new technologies. Um, of course, I think you all know Central Group, but let me just remind you um, our, our businesses. So our businesses today, as you can see, uh, in Thailand, we are present with a lot of uh, retail uh, businesses in many different categories, department store, shopping mall, sport, office and books, consumer electronics, DIY, and also some non-retail categories like, you know, hotels. Uh, we are almost always number one or number two, um, and we have a lot of brands that consumers, uh, Thai consumer, I hope many of you uh, love. Uh, but a few years ago, we started to move uh, international, and mainly in two places. 
Uh, one is Vietnam. Vietnam, you see, we are, we are, we are bringing some of the Thailand uh, categories also to Vietnam. In Vietnam, we are mainly present today in food uh, and in consumer electronics, but we are also bringing some new, um, we are entering some new categories in Vietnam. And today, Vietnam, after just a few years, is already representing about 15% of our uh, group revenues. And then a few years ago, we also entered Europe. In Europe, we have a more focused strategy, just a premium department store with uh, La Rinascente, who is the leader in Italy, and KDV, who is the leader in, in Germany. So 10 years ago, group was 100% Thai uh, focus in terms of consumer. Today, 70% Thailand and 30% the rest of the world. We, are not a, we, are not, we cannot say we are global, but I think retail business is still pretty much a local business. We want to be leader in Thailand. We want to grow in Thailand. We want to grow a lot in Vietnam. We want to grow in Europe, especially um, Germany and Italy. Uh, so today, uh, if you look at central group uh, perspective, uh, I see four big shifts that are happening. And um, sorry, the four shifts that are impacting central group are, are these four. The first one is the digital revolution, and this is the one I want to focus uh, most of my time today. Second one is China, but also now India, uh, rising importance uh, for our economies. Chinese already represent a big chunk of our customers and a big chunk of our suppliers. And India is in the, is in the road uh, also to become more and more important, both in terms of consumers and, and in terms of suppliers. The third trend is urbanization and the rising of the middle class. Of course, this is not a new trend. One of the core strategies of our group uh, is, uh, is centrality, meaning we want to be the center of life in every city we operate. And of course, this strategy makes sense because of this trend, because the world and Asia is still going urban and there is this rising uh, middle class. And then uh, the, the, the fourth trend is the aging population. Of course, so this is also not uh, a new trend, but our customers are getting older, and on average, they're getting older. And you know, we need to, we need to, take, uh, to understand their, their changes in behavior. So these are, these are the four trends. I want to focus on, on number one, not necessarily because the digital one, not because I'm uh, more passionate and very passionate about e-commerce and omnichannel, but because all of these trends are same, same importance for us, but number one is happening too fast. It's happening very fast. The others trend, they are also happening, but it, they, they, we can predict what is going to happen with China and India, with urbanization and with the aging population, but it's very hard to predict, even for experts, what is going to happen on, on the digital. So why digital is so revolutionary? Well, first point is basically is shifting the powers to the consumers, okay? So if you think about, if you think about uh, consumer uh, behavior, right? And when consumers go shopping, they start from, uh, they understand they have a need to go to shop. They start to consider what do I need to buy? Where do I buy it? And then they evaluate, they look for information about, they ask some friends uh, information to decide. And finally they buy, they do the transaction, and then they experience the product and the service. And then eventually if they like it, they become loyal. So there is this loyalty loop that I put in my, in my chart. Now, if you think about it, this has always been the case. But the new thing is now that consumers have infinite possibilities to, 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 for each of these steps, and infinite possibilities to change ideas. Well, consideration, they have much more choice of products. If you go on Amazon today, you can buy 300 million products, 300 million. I mean, even if you make a department store big as half of Bangkok, it's very hard to have space for 300 million uh, products. And then in the evaluation phase, they can go on the internet and find information about everything and find thousands of sources of information for every single product, every single retailer. 
Uh, and then, of course, they, what they can buy anywhere, anytime with the smartphone. And after they buy, they can get still a lot of information about the product, about the service. They can interact with your customer center, with their social friends, and so on. And then, all of a sudden, you know, keeping consumer loyalty is becoming much harder, much harder, because they have so much, so much choice, so much information, so much power. So that's a big trend. Uh, part of, for me, the first reason why the, the digital revolution is so important for us. The second, of course, is that the competition. I mean, some giant e-tailers, almost in every region of the world, are capturing not just a big share of the pie, but almost all of the pie. Uh, so there's no pie left for some of the retailers that are in our position. So in the US, of course, we know Amazon was already big uh, last year. They had 33% of e-commerce. Now, they, uh, last year, they had 43%. This year, they're probably going to have one every two. 50% of all online transactions is Amazon in the US. But not just the online transaction. Now, if you take even the physical retailers, Amazon today ranks number five in the US. Okay, number one is still Walmart. Amazon is number five. Uh, two years ago, it was number 15. Last year, it was number 10. <laughs> this year, is number five. Next year, I let you guess uh, where, where they're going to be, right? And this is... Uh, uh, U.S. Now, if you take Europe, very similar. It's still Amazon. If you take China, it's even worse for the traditional retailer because companies like Alibaba with Tmall or JD.com are basically eating all the online space. Look at what is left for the blue. The blue is the people like us, like Central Group, the, the, tra the, tra the, the store-based retailers. And, and even in the store, it, you know, this is just of the online transaction, but even if you look now, total transaction, so... Uh, Total retail sales, JD.com today is number one uh, in China. Uh, Tmall, they don't buy and sell. They just offer a marketplace. But JD.com is bigger than any of the store retailers in China. So this is basically the second big shift that the digital revolution is bringing to us. And then, of course, there is another shift, which is the way we work internally, the, our processes, our supply chain, our relationship with the customer. So this is why I think this is happening is happening very fast in Thailand, in Vietnam, in the, in the Southeast Asia region, in Indonesia, is just starting to happen. But in the next, the next three to five years, we will see Star Wars uh, in our countries. Uh, it's just starting to happen. We are still uh, behind, but it's going to come faster than we expect. In the US, it took Amazon 15 years. It took Alibaba in China maybe 10 years, but it, I think it will take for our region maybe three years to completely transform. So what are we going to do about it? So it's a big transformation, and it's a transformation especially on the human side, on what we, how we think about this, how we act on this. Uh, most of the CEOs, this is a McKinsey research, they interview CEOs and they ask them, how comfortable are you with this digital revolution? And there's one, this is global CEOs, one CEO out of two, said is very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. Is this all going too fast? It, we try to transform my company, but it takes much longer than the time I have. Not clear in my organization who's going to own the agenda. And you know the economics, it's very hard to make profit it's, uh, in this new world. So talent, it's all very, very challenging. So what we're doing in Central, in Central Group and what I'm doing especially is really to work in six areas to transform this group. Okay, the first one is really the mindset. You know, we can all be very worried and think about protecting the existent. But I think if you do that, it's going to be a negative sum game. So we need to see things differently. We need to see the graph half full because I think it's half, it's half full. So what I'm telling my CEOs is, guys, you need to see this as an opportunity. We are big but we can still double and triple the, our market share in most of the categories. We can still enter many countries. So we need to have a total share a mindset and to, get, to think of this opportunity to, to increase our market share. The second is to stop channel-based thinking and to start customer-based thinking, meaning I don't care what is our share online. I don't care what is our share on social media, what is our share in the store. I just care that the total share of Central Group 
is increasing and doesn't matter how much we sell online or on mobile or, or on the desktop. Third is to change our mindset about technology and I will show you what we are doing uh, in terms of organization for this. Technology is something we need to embrace. We need to, we need to learn. It cannot be outsourced to some vendors, cannot be outsourced to buying some companies or to some group that is uh, far from the headquarters. It needs to be our day-to-day -day life. We all need to become fluent in technology. Fourth is organizational ping pong. When I came here, I asked for, so who's in charge of e-commerce on the channel? And then the, the CEO told me, well, is this team is the e-commerce team. Uh, but the e-commerce team say, no, no, but it is actually the functions, our core functions that have all the power. And the core function told me, no, it's actually the CEO. So who is really in charge? And say, guys, you are all in charge. And all your KPIs from now on, we are going to put a big weight uh, on the e-commerce. For the moment, Central Group in the past used to hire people that were a track record for being great operators, maybe Farang, maybe foreigners, but they had a track record for great operators. Now we are trying to recruit fast learners, especially from Thailand. If we can't, of course, we also go outside or from Vietnam, uh, from our countries. But fast learning, for me, is more important in this new world than, being, than your track record, really. Um, and the other thing, you know, this is a group where it's almost, it's a group of entrepreneurs. We always, we are now celebrating our 70 years this year, 7-0. But, and we have, for 70 years we've been successful doing everything in home. But now, in this new world, it's going to be absolutely impossible. So we need to open up to network, to partner, to accept to be minority sometime, to JV, uh, all sorts of new, uh, of, sort of new eras. So, of course, this is a, a big revolution uh, for Central Group. In terms of organization, let me share very quickly uh, to finish what we are doing. So this is the core in terms of the organization and the bringing the re digital revolution to life is in our BUs. So we have 20 or more BUs. Each of our BUs is in charge. Because the BU, it's the closest to the customer. And for me, the closest you are to the customer, the more your opinion matters and the less my opinion uh, matters. So in the BUs, every BU CEO will be the number one responsible. But then, in every BU, we are going to put an online team, a team that just for that BU is just focused to driving all the new technology and all the new type of transaction and engagement. But they cannot be successful if the traditional function also cooperate. So we are also changing and putting uh, uh, digital guys in each of the functions. And I'm also changing the KPIs of, uh, of each of the functions. So this is the view. But now, of course, there are some expertise that is going to be very difficult for a BU to hire and to even to recruit. Because they, honestly, the salary <laughs> are very high. And, and even if our BU are big, they cannot afford it. They cannot control their costs. So at group level, we are building some roles that are there to help all the BUs go faster. Uh, so these are the three roles. One is the chief technology officer. He's basically there only to enable all the omnichannel, all the e-commerce, and all the big data and CRM strategies. He doesn't care about the traditional system. He's just there to build a new. Second is the chief customer officer who is in charge of customer strategies across the business unit. And, you know, some of you may know these people because actually a couple of them, we hired them uh, from the, the, some of the Thai companies <laughs> that we thought were quite advanced. And the third is a group omnichannel director. A uh, group omnichannel director is there basically to help all the BU transform and rethink their model. So the, the, the formula for us is, you know, the best local talent in all the BUs and the best fast learners in all the BUs, and then three very experienced, very senior people, some from Thailand, some from abroad, that can help this local talent, this fast learner, learning fast. So if it will work, I will tell you maybe in a few years, if you invite me again, but it's very exciting and we believe it's gonna work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Galante. Uh, not only explain the company structure, but also refer to the management the structural challenge. Or now we understand uh, that not only central, not only the business area, but the corporate structure or way of management also have been changing. 
And uh, the third speaker is uh, Mr. Yoshihisa Kainuma. The Kainuma san is the president and CEO of the Minebea Mitsumi. The probably, uh, I think the Minebea has been in Thailand a very long time and the very, had a huge operation. So Minebea name is very familiar with the Thailand. But now uh, the company has a name, name, new name, Minebea Mitsumi. So this is a result of the integration uh, between Minebea and the Mitsui, the official that started uh, early this year. And uh, probably, I think, uh, Minebea is basically the component company, but uh, they covered quite extensive area, for example, like uh, automobile or electronic components or electronic products. So I believe that probably everybody's life is uh, somewhere related uh, with Minebea. And actually, the uh, Kainuma-san itself is, uh, started as a lawyer. So he practiced the law both in Japan and the United States, uh, but uh, moved to the management, and now are leading the Minnesota's expansion, uh, both in the product area and also geography. So please, uh, Mr. Kainuma, uh, for your speech. Uh, thank you, Watanabe-san. Um, Mr. Okada, a CEO of Nikkei Inc., uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I feel very honored uh, to be given the opportunity to speak in front of you today. My name is Yoshi Sakainemo once again, uh, President and CEO of Minebea Mitsumi. Today, uh, for the next 10 minutes, I would like to briefly explain about our company and its policies now. <clears throat> so first of all, I would like to touch on our corporate profile, then followed by the management policy. So uh, our company was established in, back in 1951, and today there are more than about 90,000 employees and approximately 90 subsidiaries around the world. One of our unique points is that our production bases are quite diversified. In Europe, we are now building a new factory in Slovakia, and in Asia, you have a lot of plants, as you can see in this slide. I became president of this company back on April 1st, 2009, right after the Lehman crisis. Since then, our sales have been growing as shown in this slide. We are engaging in the business of manufacturing a large variety of parts and components and are diversifying not only products but also in production bases. Our product lines consist of machined components, electric devices, and rotary components. Some of our products enjoy a high percentage in the world market, as you can see in this slide. The best example would be the ball bearing. We have a worldwide market share of roughly 60%, but up to 22 millimeter outer diameter ball bearings and producing approximately 270 million pieces every month. So this is electric devices and components, uh, but uh, let me skip the details of the explanation regarding each of our products due to time constraint. Our third category is rotary components, uh, namely they are motors. We are producing roughly 60 million pieces motors every month. As Watanabe-san clearly said, I'm really proud that our parts and components are definitely used in your everyday life. Here are some of our products applications. So next I'm moving on to our management policy. First, I want to talk about the core value of our management. I like this Japanese word, KA, very much, which means a management in English term. 
Though I don't have much time to explain, I believe that KA means to make a company sustainable. And then, um, how can we make the company sustainable? I think there are two main strategies. Number one is a growth strategy, which means maximizing a company's growth and profit. And number two is a, to prepare ourselves against a variety of risks. Then let me talk about the maximization of growth and profit. Passion to create value through difference is our corporate slogan, which is written right under the, our corporate logo. This precisely expresses how we are going to maximize the profit. In other words, I think it is fair to say that we will create value through differentiation. Then question would be, how are we going to differentiate ourselves? Uh, we are quite unique company since we are manufacturing for ball bearings, motors, to LED even backlights. So we are only one company on this planet. So therefore, we are aiming to make a core uh, competence by combining various products. The world's electronic mechanic solutions were registered right after I had become president of this company. So we will create unique products through machine components and electronic devices, as well as a variety of such technologies as wireless communication and software, which we acquired through the business integration with Mitsumi Electronics the other day. By creating our core competence in this way, we will differentiate from our competitors. So formula to win is one-stop service. In today's rapid technological changes and developments, uh, by vertically integrating various technologies, we could be a parts maker which satisfies most of the customer's needs. As customers' needs will become more complicated and difficult, I think that only companies which can answer the customer's needs can survive. It is like Amazon. Amazon was so-called an online sales company before, but not anymore. Uh, they are changing to even a logistic company. Then how can we implement one-stop service? As I said just now, we need to manage the company by trying to realize a variety of synergy and by acquiring what we do not have uh, uh, through M&A. These two wheels definitely drive uh, this our company. Next, let me talk about risk management. So there are several risks uh, kinds of risks. They are external, internal, and technological risks. First, about external risks. We are aware of the importance of redundancy in managing the company, not only at the global level, but also at the local level. This means that we can move production to other locations if production at one plant becomes meaningless for a variety of reasons. We call this extra cap capability as redundancy, which we think is very important. I think this is a countermeasure against various risks, such as natural disasters, foreign exchange, and changing trade policy by local government, etc. We are also aware of the importance of the redundancy locally as well. Thailand is a good example, and we have se seven uh, factories here in Thailand. So another external risk is worldwide business fluctuation. Just like Lehman crisis, a sudden change in the economic environment can have a serious impact on the company management. I think the best measure against this risk is to make the company irreplaceable in the world's economic activities. 
In this sense, maximization of growth and profit and management against external risks can be said as the flip side of the same coin. As for internal risks, every company faces similar risks, so I do not have many comments here today. So against technological changes, our goal is to build a system in which our company can be always ready for technological changes or developments. We are now trying to establish three major pillars. If one pillar suffers damage, the remaining pillars would, like, would, would make the company sustainable. Therefore, I'm always thinking, sorry about that. Therefore, I'm always thinking about the categories of core, sub-core, and non-core products. The core products are the products which do not easily disappear in any circumstances and should have a strong presence in a niche market. By raising these products as a cash cow, we are trying to challenge for subcore products bringing in large profits, even though the subcore products tend to be volatile in accordance with technological changes. By doing this, we could minimize technological risks. At the same time, we could maximize our growth and profitability, reducing the external risks. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you, Kainima-san. So now uh, we move to the uh, discussion. And uh, later, uh, I will take the question from the floor. And uh, actually now, yeah, as everybody's saying, we have been experiencing huge change, uh, very rapid change, and also the many challenges. So of course, this is a global level, but probably at first we start from Asia, uh, because now we have the meeting here in Bangkok. So first is, uh, as uh, Nakaonima san explain, uh, explained that, uh, how about the, what is happening in ASEAN? The, including the Thailand, and uh, everybody know that uh, this year is the uh, 50th anniversary of the ASEAN, and also uh, for the last uh, 20 or 30 years, uh, many multinational companies or domestic companies uh, built a quite sophisticated and complicated supply chain network within the ASEAN, especially in the manufacturing field uh, like uh, Minebe and uh, Mitsui. But uh, now also at the same time we see maybe our individual country has also own um, industrial policy and uh, sometimes so it doesn't match the some total initiative by ASEAN and also in individual uh, countries industrial policy and because uh, now AEC has been started uh, more than one year uh, but people suggested or pointed out the progress is uh, a bit slow so first year I want to ask the Kainuma san so uh, this environment, or probably the current situation of the AEC, will push the, your company more uh, to build uh, some network within ASEAN, or uh, if you find now some difficulty, the, what kind of measures uh, should be taken by the relative authorities or individual countries? Uh, <clears throat> what I'm saying, you are right. Um, I think uh, in the long run, uh, I would say uh, AEC system uh, really, you know, work. But in reality, right now, we have some uh, obstacles uh, to make it happen. Uh, for example, I mean, the, what I can tell you is, uh, let's say, the uh, income gap. So in the Southeast Asian countries, uh, we have a lot of co countries, but uh, they are a huge income gap. So um, uh, the, quite naturally, the local government has to focus on that to uh, cope with, uh, you know, uh, enhancing their uh, income uh, by, uh, through, uh, you know, several means. So usually the, the uh, industry policy is not coordinated among the countries. So that is one of the, you know, kind of a, um, uh, the problem that um, AEC uh, will proceed further. And um, uh, non-tariff barrier is also uh, kind of something like that. Um, we have a factory in Cambodia and Thailand, 
and uh, uh, every day uh, from Thailand factory, we are bringing in a lot of parts and components uh, to Cambodia. So when your truck, uh, you know, comes to the border, uh, they've got to change the truck head because uh, Thailand uh, right hand drive, but uh, Cambodia is left hand drive. So therefore, under the regulation, you've got to change the truck head, which you know, waste of time, waste of cost, but uh, both governments are trying to maintain truck industry, of course. So therefore, that kind of thing happens. So um, maybe the, uh, I think it would be very difficult to accommodate this kind of situation, but uh, what I can tell you is, uh, first of all, uh, maybe the first several years, each country has to uh, concentrate on increasing the, uh, I mean, the dimi uh, diminishing at the uh, uh, income gap. And then the uh, coordinated policy, uh, definitely uh, necessary. Uh, uh, when, you know, we are uh, constructing the factory in Slovakia now, uh, EC uh, will, EC gave us uh, subsidies. Uh, because EC has a very coordinated uh, operations and, uh, uh, you know, policy. Uh, if we uh, set up the uh, factory in a rural area, the EC will subsidize, not Slovakia. Uh, so that kind of coordination definitely necessary uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, AEC development. Thank you, Kaimas. How about uh, Garante-san? The AEC or ASEAN uh, business integration is the first started the manufacturing side, but later uh, now they try to move to like a more service industry. Have, uh, later we have the, some financial integration uh, panel sessions separately, but uh, it's also started in the retail, the business. And uh, Central, uh, as you mentioned, now that has operation in Vietnam. And how do you think uh, this uh, the situation the ASEAN will need more some uh, coordination or integration work about the regulation, even in the field of the service. So for our group, it's going to be absolutely critical to have the region, the world region, moving more and more into a, a free trade area. Uh, because, of course, today it limits our possibility to expand, both on the demand side, but also on the, on the supply side. Uh, so, so that's going to be, let's say, for our core business, already already necessary. But I would like to point out another aspect, which is uh, the e-commerce and the high-tech startups. So, why do you think that there are so many startups today? So many of the very famous startups in the U.S. or in China. It's not because these people are smarter. Actually, Vietnam, Thailand, and many of our countries produce even smarter people, but they have a very big market. So if they're successful, there's only, out of 100 startup, 99 fail, one succeed. But if you succeed in the US, it's billions of dollars. If you succeed in China, it's billions of dollars. The problem is if you succeed in China, it's millions of dollars. So the only way, I mean, I'm not saying it's gonna be sufficient, but the necessary condition, if we want our region to uh, produce many more startup, many more of the future e-commerce and high-tech winners is going to be to give them a large market. So 99 will still fail, maybe 98, but the one or two that win, they become really large and they are able to compete in a global scale. So for me, that's really um, a critical reason why none of our uh, region country can really succeed individually unless we open up the whole region. Probably yeah, we need to see more like ASEAN startup. Yeah, now uh, every country, including like, Thailand and Singapore, is quite active to promote or encourage, but they want to uh, set up their own country to start up. But maybe their business failed. We need to be expanding. Yeah, so this is a good session. Thank you. But how about so now region and the world? And in the case of the Thai Union, so you are playing field is more uh, all over the world. But uh, just as you mentioned, that it's a huge change. So including uh, Donald Trump and also more 
like uh, a one country policy or also the, some change of the discussion of the trading framework, so including the TPP or RCEP or other discussion is going on. And the individual country's stance is also quite different. And uh, so uh, you mentioned that, so also the Thai Union has to work, so according to that change, but could you uh, a bit elaborate more? Yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are so many changes, and uh, today I, I find that the visibility is uh, very low, and with all the, the changes, I think the company needs to develop the ability to cope with all the changes. Uh, for example, the protectionist policy, uh, right now most of the country, especially in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, would encourage more domestic uh, uh, investment. So for us, uh, as Thai Union, we have many uh, manufacturing footprint in many countries. So we, 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 we do have ability to move around or shift our production to whatever required. So I think that's very important uh, today. And uh, also look at the stability. It's also a very, very key uh, issue right now. Uh, in our growth uh, uh, strategy in the past, uh, we look at uh, some region as an emerging market, uh, a region like uh, Africa and Middle East. But recently, with uh, the instability in the region, like in the Middle East, with Qatar and uh, United Emirates, uh, we find it's more and more uh, difficult and uh, less attractive for us to make investment in those areas. So today, for Thai Union, I think the only bright spot for us is back to uh, Asia. Yes, right now, like uh, China, CLMV. And uh, for CLMV, it's uh, 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 three fonts. One is for the sort of raw material. Second is for the low-cost production base. And third is a new market opportunities for us. Uh, but uh, regarding the CREP, uh, it's like uh, China is uh, quite uh, active to promote. But so also, at the, on the other hand, uh, some uh, ASEAN countries, including Japan, is uh, now try to push uh, TPP-11, the TPP without the United States first, and maybe the RCEP or FTARP is uh, maybe future of the, some regional trade integration. But are you optimistic of the free trade scheme, not only in Asia, probably in the world? Personally, I don't quite uh, believe, I'm not very optimistic about free trade agreement. Because from my past experiences, it takes a very long time. And sometimes it needs uh, 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 unity among the region. But it's important because it provides uh, duty-free access to the market. For example, uh, Vietnam, which is a member of in the TPP, it now has the privilege uh, for EU market. So I think that's the attractiveness for investment in Vietnam for now. So for Thailand, I think it's important to make sure that we don't uh, uh, lose the, the, the trend. You know, make sure that we, 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 we can uh, join with the group in, in the region to, to make agreement with either U.S. or in Europe, you know, and other uh, trading partners. But also probably the trade is uh, one way, and but probably also the other way is having some physical the presence in the, the other market or in the other region. So in this meaning, like uh, Minabe Amitsu and also the Thai Union has been very active. Uh, they're using the merger and acquisition the, to expand. But uh, so probably the first, uh, Mr. Kainum, so how are important uh, this merger and acquisition for your company uh, to expand the business? What is the main purpose, like uh, to get the brand or to get technology or maybe uh, to get human resources? What is the main purpose? Actually, uh, uh, we have done, uh, if I recall correctly, 42 uh, M&A. 42. 42. Over the, over the last uh, 30, 35 years. So um, we love M&A uh, simply because we can buy time. So when you start your business from scratch, uh, it would take a lot of time and efforts. But when you buy a company, you get uh, you know entire organization uh, from first place, so which definitely um, uh, you know enhance the kind of uh, uh, time uh, effect uh, or reduce the time consumption. Uh, that is one thing. Um, 
Number two, uh, what we are trying to do is kind of a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, because uh, we have a lot of technologies uh, necessary, but some technology we couldn't uh, you know, grow that easily. So therefore, we look for the you know, merger and acquisition opportunity to put uh, some piece of uh, puzzle uh, to fit. So uh, we m made a management inter integration with um, uh, Mitsumi uh, as of January tw 27th uh, this year. The reason why, once again, you know, I uh, made a presentation, but um, uh, Mitsumi is uh, very good at um, wireless communication technology, software communication technology, which we didn't have. So um, uh, M&A is a very good uh, kind of uh, uh, measures uh, to get the very important and necessary uh, kind of a technology or resource uh, in a very short period of time. How about uh, Mr. Tedapon? Also, Thai Union is a very active, uh, not only in Asia, like uh, India or United States or European, yeah, almost everywhere in the world. But what is the uh, uh, most the important point when you see the, some probably possible target? Which do you focus? Well, uh, I must say that we used to love M&A, uh, but today M&A is not our key priority. I must say that with the market environment today, as I mentioned, uh, it's very hard for us to find a, a good value for our acquisition. So today, I think uh, with all the landscape change, uh, we feel that we should now back to basic, look at our existing core business, how we can embrace technologies to drive our costs down, and to, to see how we can improve our services to our customer. And not only that, we also try to look into high value industry where we can make investment, especially innovation. I think the company has been investing in innovation, especially the last uh, five years. The innovation uh, covered quite an intensive area, not only like manufacturing technology, but also research and development and many other ideas. Yes, uh, in our sector, due to the tight uh, profit margin, uh, there are very few companies who are uh, willing to invest in true innovation, which require true science and technologies. I think Thai Unit is one of the very few that invest in this area, and we try to uh, uh, get out of commodity that we are in today. As a canned seafood and frozen seafood today, it's quite commodity. So how we can add more value, create more value, we try to uh, invest in the area where we can connect with a high value industry uh, such as cosmetic and or nutrition. So we try now to look at all part of the whole tuna fish or the whole shrimp, not only the meat part, but the other part like bones, skin, uh, blood meat, etc. how we can add value on this area, yes. But also uh, those kind of the new the progress also requires some like a different kind of the talent maybe I think that regarding uh, including the research or engineers. Yeah, how about in the case of the uh, Mr. Garante, the probably you also mentioned the huge change uh, including like a technology or digital innovation but also it requires quite different kind of the talent that compared with the uh, current the central employee. How uh, do you get those kind of talent or how do you training those kind of time? Uh, maybe let, let me start with the m and uh, part a bit uh, because it's linked. Uh, I think at least for us, but I also think in general, the, the time we are living is more a time for A than for M. So we talk about m and A. I I don't believe a lot in the M now. I believe a lot in the A. Because mergers are quite complex, don't increase your speed and actually make yourself a lot internally focused because now you need to manage the merger of the two cultures. I think in the times we live, speed, I think Kunti Lapon said, be nimble, I think, right? So it's really the key. And, um, and for this, I think, you know, acquisition, maybe of a sm small, somehow smaller targets, but with higher potential, is more, is more relevant. Um, but different type of acquisition what we do in the past. So in the past, in the 
pass for central group, when you acquire a company, you acquire 100%, and then you put someone from the family to run it. Okay, so this time I think it's, it's pretty much gone. When we acquire a company now, first thing, we don't want to acquire 100%. <laughs> Second, we absolutely want the management to stay and to feel they're independent and not part of a big corporate, because the, especially the new talent, the innovative talent, they hate to feel that they're part of a big company. They want to feel pretty much independent. They want to get all the benefit of a big company without the burden of a big company. So more and more now we are looking for smaller company. We are looking actually to acquire the talent, somehow also the technology, but I would say if I need to choose, it's more the talent for us than the technology. And then make sure, first and foremost, that the, 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 the entrepreneurs and the top management team of the target we acquire stays and stays at least for a minimum five years. Minimum five years? Yeah. How about in the case of Thai Union? The, the companies, uh, Thai Union, acquire well, uh, management usually yeah, stay? I think we are in probably different uh, situation. Uh, in seafood sector, most of the companies owned by family, and uh, we found it's very hard to uh, manage these uh, owners. So therefore, uh, we are very much interested in more in acquiring 100%, okay? And I think uh, when we acquire companies, we usually acquire brands and we acquire people. Uh, in terms of talent, we talk about talent, I think it's a challenge to recruit, retain, and also to manage the talent, especially in our case, we have acquired quite a number of companies in the last few years and in uh, different regions, in different countries. So the key challenge for our company today is more how to manage diversity, how to manage people from different countries. And this is the challenge that we are facing right now. Mr. Kainu about in the case of the Minebe Amitsi, usually people stay or uh, there will be some change? Actually, uh, uh, you know, we have a variety of the kind of a levels, you know, to the operator level to the management. So we are now applying the different, of course, approach to grow the, you know, uh, human resources. And let's say uh, um, what we are doing in Cambodia is every day uh, we make a, a writing, reading Khmer class. So um, uh, some people are participating in English class every day. So they're really eager to learn. So we give the opportunity to them to learn more. And then that would kind of uh, grow the royalty to the company. So uh, the lower level is, you know, we always watch and, uh, you know, uh, the environment of the, you know, working environment and uh, always changing those kind of environment uh, including the education as well. And management level, uh, we have uh, uh, um, uh, executive officer, I mean, uh, a group executive officer system. Uh, usually, you know, we have a lot of uh, executive Japanese officers, but uh, we have 12 uh, foreign uh, group executives which are treated exactly the same as the Japanese executives. So they are called three times a year, and uh, we exchange the you know, issues and um, uh, so that kind of thing. So it depends upon the, uh, the level of the, you know, the employees. Also probably the one thing the new for, if the company goes to the beyond the border, it's probably the, there are more different kind of the stakeholders the, around the company. So uh, probably the more requirement of the sustainable development or sustainable growth and the, probably the uh, corporate governance or uh, corporate social responsibility. And uh, just uh, Mr. Tenapon, the refer to the, your agreement with uh, Greenpeace, it's also the, some kind of the, the different kind of the stakeholder. But uh, how do you think the uh, company's uh, CSR the, the necessity, or is this a risk, or is this a, some kind of new opportunity, the two goals? Yes, uh, CSR or sustainability development in our company is not just activities. It's become part of our business strategies. And uh, in seafood sector, this is very uh, big issues, as you may know, uh, in regards to resource management. Uh, consumer right now 
uh, demanding to understand where the origin of the product from, and they're also demanding to understand how you treat people, how you catch fish, to make sure that the resource is sustainable in the future. So that's why I mentioned two areas of our focus today are on the resource management and also the labor practice. So the, and uh, as a leader in the industry, you also became the target, especially from the, all the NGOs. And I must say that Thai Union has been a, a very uh, dear friend with Greenpeace in the last few years. Uh, we've been attacked in uh, numerous occasions. But having said that, we cannot walk away. We need to engage with the, all the NGOs. We need to work with them. We need to understand them. And we need to make sure that they understand us. And it's, uh, uh, just recently, it uh, was one of a very successful uh, accomplishment for our team that we can finally agree with Greenpeace. So today, Greenpeace not only not attack us, but also support us and promote us. And it's very crucial now today, not only to the consumer, but to all the major customer, especially in the US and in Europe. So sustainability, it's come with cost, but if we can do it right, it can also help us in terms of commercialization too. Thank you very much. And uh, we still have the maybe around 15 minutes, and probably the one last question at this uh, the frame is uh, maybe uh, some impact of the disruption of the technology in the new market. And uh, every company has the relationship with this trend, but probably the uh, Mr. Galantis area is the most connected. And also you differ. It's not only the technology, but also change the way of the customers buying, but also probably now company has uh, a lot of data, or big data, so maybe I can know the customer more well. But uh, from your point of view, maybe after five years, 10 years, what kind of the e-business, uh, business model is now we see? Yeah, what kind of the, uh, the big change are you expecting? So this is um, um, absolutely the big data is uh, a core part of our strategy. Probably uh, what we see as a trend is uh, retailers, they started to be valuable because they, they, they were places where people could find product probably in the future will be even more relevant because these are places where brands find consumer data. So I think there's no brand that can have the same 360 degree view of a consumer that a retailer can have, even more if a retailer is omnichannel, so it's not just following the consumer when they buy in the store, but also, so we have today already, and this has been built over the years, the most successful, I think, uh, loyalty card program uh, in, in Thailand. We have uh, more 12, about 12 million card holders, half, half of which uh, are active. And these are the, probably the, a lot, the, these families, these six million families, they represent a big chunk of the, let's say, consuming population in Thailand. And we have these um, several millions also in Vietnam and in, uh, and in Europe. The problem is we don't do nothing with this data. Or let's say, let me not be negative, we do very little with this data. Actually what we know, because we ask the customer, customers are happy to give you data because they believe you will do something good for them with this data, you will serve them better and so on. So that we are in the situation where we have a lot of data, but we are unable to transform this, inside, this into a concrete advantage for our customers. So this is an area, as I mentioned in our organization, now we have two people, one is the chief technology officer, the other is the chief customer officer. Their primary responsibility is to help us use the data to serve our customer better, but also in the future, to really tighten the relationship with the brand because the, the brand like uh, Kuntira Pong brand, they would love to know what we know about their customer. Who, who is buying just tuna, who is buying tuna, but sometimes not loyal with their um, Thai Union uh, brands and, and what do they buy when they don't buy uh, Thai Union products. So we know all this stuff, we just don't use it. Uh, in the case of the maybe the mini bear, those uh, digital technology is more like some new business development side, maybe IoT or AI. How do you see maybe after five years or ten years your business 
or what kind of business you are watching, how we will change it? It is uh, quite difficult to say, uh, you know, in a very concrete manner because uh, we are parts manufacturers. We are always, uh, you know, following the, uh, you know, the final, you know, assembly manufacturers uh, who are now uh, doing the uh, R&Ds for the new products. So what I can tell you is uh, as, uh, you know, the good um, uh, parts manufacturers, we've, we've got to be always ready uh, to accommodate that kind of a technology change. So um, that's only what we can do. And uh, um, uh, that's it. About uh, Thai Union, where is uh, not only the technology, maybe geography, or maybe the market or products, what would be your like, a potential target after five years or 10 years? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, even we are in the low tech industry, we still cannot ignore the technologies. Uh, I personally, myself, right now, also spend some of my time to study about technologies. And uh, not only use technology in your organization, but also understand what technology changed the landscape of your business. For example, online channel is growing everywhere. How can we write on the web with the technology companies? And also, it also creates very stiff competition in the marketplace, in the retail sector, in everywhere I see in U.S. Recently, uh, Amazon just acquired Whole Foods, which is one of the major retailers in U.S. What does it mean? In China, Alibaba also acquired some brick and mortar company. What does it mean for us? But what certain to me is that it will lead to price competition. So even what you've been doing for decades and you believe that you are one of the most uh, competitive companies in the world, I think it may not be true today. With all the available technologies in the marketplace, with all the, the technologies in the marketplace, I think the company needs to rethink, relook at the business model. Do we need to change our model? How we can embrace the new, new, new technologies to even change our cost or, or drive down our cost. So to me, that's why I mentioned earlier, in our company today, cost is become our number one topic. So. so how about, our, is there any questions from the floor? Okay, uh, the lady in the front. Maybe somebody will bring the mic. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yes, good afternoon. My question is um, actually more for um, Mr. Galante because I'm in a consumer products business. So in the U.S., um, a lot of companies, especially selling consumer products, are moving from retail shops to selling just online. A lot of sh retail shops are closing down. Mm. So, um, at, But in Thailand, a lot of shopping malls are opening up. So. Um, in your opinion, in how many years is Thailand going to be the same as U.S.? Oh. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> I, I don't have the crystal ball, but I would say we are, we are far away, uh, very far away from, from, from the U.S. Um, just because even the, the nature of our cities, of our, you know, where the uh, consumer live uh, in terms of our city, the geography, the distances are not really the same that uh, we, you find in the US and in China. Having said that, uh, I think that probably we are reaching a stage in Thailand where the new square meters that are open don't correspond to the growth opportunity that the market represents. So the more square meter will be open, the more for the industry is going to be reducing the productivity in a way, increasing, increasing the cost. So this is, I think, I think we will see, uh, I'm hopeful that we will see a slowdown in the square meter and the shift of investment uh, from the big retailers. This is going to be certainly the case for, for Central Group into, into online and e-commerce, which is where we see, to your also previous question, where we see the opportunities where we're starting to screen. We actually bought a few years ago the number one uh, e-book 
uh, player in Thailand and they were profitable and they will continue to be profitable. But this doesn't mean that we still have a, we still, I think, have an opportunity with many categories in the stores, with most categories in the stores. But, of course, the investment in the past has been 99% in the stores and in the future, this ratio will be uh, very, very different. Thank you. So, next questions. Anything, uh, not only like a global strategy, but also it is okay about like a Thailand or Asian market. Okay. So, uh, if there is no probably, maybe yeah, I can ask one more. The last one. Uh, everybody now refer to India and China, and so uh, there are now a lot of assessment, especially like a China slowdown. The people say China slowdown, or but some people say China is uh, still quite allegiant and also still the some potential. And also the India, uh, India is uh, not like a homogeneous market, but uh, it is true the more uh, Indian people are started to spending more money in that way. So how do you see uh, the future of those two big market? So uh, first, uh, how about the, in case of the Thai Union? Mm -hmm. The market potential of the, uh, China and the India. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, China, although the economy has slowed down a little bit, but it still has a, 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 a quite a high growth compared to many other countries. And for Thai Union, we uh, have not penetrated this market uh, uh, seriously in the past, so it's quite new. Having said that, the, the China is attractive in terms of size, but in terms of complexity, it's also very challenging to uh, get into uh, China successfully, it may need some uh, cautious approach. Uh, right now, we are trying very hard to penetrate China. For India, uh, it's, it's our, uh, one of our key uh, manufacturing uh, uh, footprint. We have uh, made investment in India uh, many years ago, and it still has a, a high growth potential for us. In terms of domestic market in India, I think it will take some time, but we also have our eyes on India too. How about Mr. Garantia? Also, India, the importance is not only for the market, but also probably procurement, the center, of course. How about in the case of the... Yes, so first of all, let me say, I think we are lucky. Of course, one and a half year ago, it was in Europe. I think you are very worried, and all this uh, conference is about being worried about the global shift. I think we are still in one of the luckiest places in the world. China is slowing down, but it's much bigger. So, okay, it's slowing down, but it's much bigger. So the, the, the dollar effect of China is gonna be, if anything, more important in the future than it was last year. Uh, India is the second, actually, big contributor to the global growth. And Thailand and uh, CLMV and uh, Southeast Asia is perfectly placed in the middle of these two Giants, we basically are the two big growing economies in the world because now Russia, Brazil, that's kind of, let's say, quote unquote, history. So we are there and we are lucky. Uh, of course, in terms of uh, your question about import, of course, I would say import, and when many retailers thought about global sourcing, including Central Group, mainly has been things that are produced either in, in, in Thailand or in China. But more and more, we see India and the uh, counties adjacent to India as a very, very interesting uh, um, uh, sourcing area for our private label. So more and more, I think, you know, Southeast Asia and, um, and even China, but for sure Southeast Asia, we need to transform not from manufacturer of cheap products, but to manufacturer of quality products. And more and more, we will go and source for the entry level Still good quality, but very, very low price in the Indian uh, region in the future. How about Mr. Kainumar? Of course, um, in the Bayamitsi strategy is quite closely related the like uh, uh, the final products that make the strategy. But how do you see the future of India and China both as a market, but also probably manufacturing hub? Okay, so uh, what I can tell you is, uh, you know, China, Chinese market is really changing. Uh, in the past, uh, you know, Chinese market is simply focusing on the very cheap products, as he said. 
And but uh, um, so let's say Bakim cleaners, just uh, you know Bakim cleaners. But now they are focusing on the much better efficiency. So cars are you know more functionality. So therefore, you know, we have a lot of big chance, even for Japanese, you know, parts manufacturers or the, or the final assembly manufacturers in China, because now they need the better products. So over the next five, ten years, Chinese market is going to be like a U.S. market. Uh, so I'm very, pretty much excited about that. And uh, uh, on the other hand, the Indian market just, you know, started. So I would say it would take some time uh, to catch up, uh, but, but definitely they are coming up, maybe within 10 years or so. But then they need a really high quality products in, at that time. So um, that is what I can see uh, on both markets. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tedapon. Thank you, Mr. Garante. And thank you, Mr. Kainuma. So we have to the close uh, this session. So uh, please say the big applause for the distinguished speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you once again for a very insightful discussion. How about another round of applause for our panelists?